name is Guido Fritz. I'm the Associate Dean for Graduate Business Programs at St. Mary's College. Uh, it's my great pleasure on behalf of St. Mary's College and the Alumni Association uh, to welcome you to this uh, exciting event we have tonight. Uh, it's uh, actually an event that's been put together by the uh, Alumni Council South Bay Chapter, and we're very, very delighted to have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Moore here today to speak uh, to us about some exciting new ideas. I would like to invite Dean Zhang Li, who will give his welcome and who will introduce uh, Jeffrey Moore to, to today's uh, uh, exciting presentation. Dean Li. Uh, first of all, welcome to uh, this uh, high impact dynamic event uh, for tonight. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, some of our board members who are also attending today's event, uh, Jim Blackwell, uh, the executive vice president of Chevron, is in the audience today. Also have Michael Fox, uh, CEO of Goodwill, uh, also coming to today's event. And Pat Soaps is also our board member. Uh, she's a board director for Hitachi and multiple other companies. We also have a uh, special guest uh, join us uh, as well, and Jay Pryor, Executive Vice President of Chevron, also in the audience. We have Shirlene Chen, Vice President of Marketing for Cloud Telecomputers, coming join us. And Jeff Mendelson, the CEO of New, Paper, New Leaf Papers, uh, join us as well. And of course, I welcome you uh, to this very exciting intellectual uh, event. Uh, now, it's a great honor for me to introduce our guest, feature speaker of today, Jeffrey Moore. Jeffrey, as you know, is a worldly known author, speaker, and advisor. He's also the managing director of Jeffrey Moore Consulting, a venture partner at Moore Davido Ventures. He's also chairman of Emeritus TCG Advisors Academy Group. Recognized as a leading business advisor, Jeffrey divides his time between consulting on strategy and transformation challenges with senior executives and on developing model, model, uh, mental models to support his advisory practice. As you know, his books, uh, Crossing the Chasm, Inside the Tornado, The Guerrilla Game, Living on the Fault Line, and Dealing with Darwin. I don't know about you. When I teach in my classes, we require my students reading all those books. <laughs> and, and those books are bestsellers and require readings, not just at St. Mary's, but also at leading business schools uh, around the world. And based on his years of working experience, uh, experience working with the large enterprises and senior executives, his newest book uh, entitled Escape Velocity, Free Your Company's Future from the Pole of the Past will be published in September in 2011. So today, uh, you're going to hear the prequel and, and the <laughs> early version of the book. So make sure you buy the book when the book comes out. <laughs> Jeffrey is a founder of both the Chasm Group and TCG Advisors. Earlier in his career, he was a principal and partner at Regis McKenna Incorporation, a leading high-tech marketing strategy and communication company in the Valley, as you know. And for the decade prior, Jeffrey is a sales and marketing executive in the software industry. He holds bachelor degree in literature from Stanford University and a doctor degree in literature from the University of Washington. We really appreciate Jeffrey to come in today, uh, particularly because uh, he has his brother, Peter, uh, coming from uh, out town to visit him and he's spending time with us today, so really appreciate it. And ladies and gentlemen, let's get to why we're here today, and please welcome Jeffrey Moore. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thanks a lot. Great. Okay, so this is working. Good. So, yeah, as, as Dr. Lee said, by the way, he said St. Mary's and leading business schools. He meant to say other leading <laughs> business schools. Uh, so so t today, I, I do have a new book coming out, and when I have a book coming out, I end up giving talks around it. And everybody, every product needs an alpha site, and that would be you. 
Okay? So this is, this is actually the first, I think the very first public talk I've given on, on uh, chunks of this uh, material. So, you know, no warranties expressed or implied. And, and all feedback is welcome because this thing is, this thing is going to get better. But I do want to share with you these ideas because they're, they're, we're pretty passionate about them. And, and I hope, I hope they will, they will re uh, resonate with you. We'll, we'll see where it goes. So this book, as, as Dr. Lee was saying, is in the context of other books. And I guess the first question you sort of ask is, why all the books? I mean, it's like, I mean, don't you have anything else to do? Uh, uh, part of the deal is about every three or four or five years, enough changes in the high tech sector that the playbooks that were kind of working then sort of seem to have problems now. And, and, and in particular, if you think about high tech, in high tech, values created very early in the game at a time when there's no data. There's no, you, you can't use traditional consulting methodologies around research and kind of you know, doing the analytics and whatever. There's some you can do, but, but it's, it's basically high risk, low data decision making. And in that world, models and frameworks help. And so updating the models and frameworks to sort of take on the next generation of issues. The intent of this stuff is all, every book, the intent's the same, is to create a vocabulary that you and your colleagues can use to, to sort of assess where you're at, where do you, what kind of issues are we facing, are we dealing with them correctly? Try to put some of the, you know, the elephant in the room problem. Put a name on some of the things that everybody knows are going on, but they're kind of taboo to talk about. So how, how do we get them on the table so you can make the critical calls? So with this particular book, so why this one now? Now, in the first 10 years, from 1990 to 2000, Crossing the Chasm Inside the Tornado, the Gorilla Game, that was about, uh, that was about the great rise of the tech sector. Uh, sometimes we call it the time of the great happiness. Because, because everybody's stock went up. I mean, you were an admin, and you were worth a million dollars. It was amazing. You know, and then it was like, bang, what happened? So the last decade has been sort of, it hasn't been the trough of disillusion exactly, but it's definitely been a sobering decade in which we spent much more time with larger companies than with smaller companies. And, and, and so part of this is saying, well, so what were the lessons there? What are the issues there? And of course, as you imagine, they're very different. The, the, the larger company gets that technology keeps changing the game. And by the way, people don't join large companies and become brain dead. Right? Entrepreneurs often believe this, but it's not true. It's not true. Uh, they, they, they get that there's these extraordinary opportunities, and they get that they got to engage with them. But this but here is you start facing massive internal resistance to reallocating resources. That's a phrase that if you've ever been in a large company, yeah, yeah, that, that's kind of an understatement. So year in, year out, what happens is even though there's total intention to move, migrate the portfolio from lower growth opportunities to high growth opportunities. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what you want to do. It's really, really hard to do. And that, that's kind of what I, what I want to talk about here. And, and the issue is at some point it's like, OK, we've known about this for at least 15 years. The Innovator's Dilemma was written in like 1995. It's like, come on, people. We know about this. What are we going to do about it? And, and, and if you look at what's going on, uh, lots and lots of companies have been subject to this disease. I mean, this is just in the tech sector primarily. And these companies do not exist anymore. And if you think about that, think about not all the, not only just, well, don't even worry about the shareholders. Let's just think about the stakeholders. How many families, how many employees, how many customers, how many partners had to completely revamp what they were doing. How much just, how many times do we have to rebuild a global sales force again and again and again because we keep, you know, we keep losing the, the infrastructure that holds that thing together? And, and it's, it's, it, 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 you talk about waste. You know, if you, in, a, in an era where we don't want to waste stuff, what, we, we got to do better than this. We cannot have this record. And by the way, these were not like dumb companies. These were the best companies we had, right? So, so, so in other words, this is not like, People, these are stupid managers, and the smart managers were in some other, some other room. Right? This was us. I mean, we ought to look at this thing and say, look, these guys were at least, we have no reason to believe that we're better than them. So whatever's going on, it must be pretty tough because lo lots of challenge. So we spent the decade looking at this. And there are five what we would call points of failure where you just say, historically, this is, where, this is where we reach for the brass ring, but somehow the brass ring uh, eludes our grasp. And the first one is just getting out of the slow growth categories and into the high growth categories. 
Uh, Dr. Lee mentioned my brother Peter's here. Peter worked with a man named John Phelan at the Wall Street, who, who ran the New York Stock Exchange. John was on the board of Kodak. How would you like to be the board member of Kodak and say, I claim Kodak's strat, that was mine, that was mine. And, and, and you say, what, what happened, John? Why couldn't you guys see? And, and John would say, see, we hired George Fisher in 1994 from Motorola because we knew that film was going to eventually be displaced. But every year the problem was I could either take capital and put it into a business that printed money because the film business until it stopped was an unbelievable cash cow or I could just pour it into this digital hole and have it disappear. And so, you know, the, I mean, it, it, these issues about how you get out of the growth cat it's a tough issue for, 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 for large companies, right? This resource allocation thing, what you have to do to fight this battle is you've got to put a lot of resources in a very few places. Well, that's what they teach you in MBA school. You got every, everybody, all the cohorts here tonight, I was talking to a great cohort tonight. Go, yeah, that's right. If when I'm in charge, that's what we're going to do, right? Well, yeah, well, just find out, right? Because, <laughs> you remember Brad Garlick was at Yahoo last year and he wrote the Peanut Butter Manifesto? Did you, did you remember that memo that got, because he said at Yahoo we spread our R&D budget like peanut butter? Because everybody feels like they need a little entitlement. You know, my group ought to have a little of that R&D budget. I need a little of that stuff too, right? And so it's very, very hard to make those asymmetrical bets. Then this issue of, you know, Jeff Moore, these guys come around and say, hey, just crossing the chasm, dude, pick a segment, win the segment. And they go, good idea. And then they try to get this large global force to actually focus on a niche market. It's like, eh, eh, okay. Then, then this issue about, about we're going to create a product that really stands out. Because we've seen the iPod, and we've seen the iPhone, and we've seen the iPad. We, we got it, right? And then we end up with, you know, the BlackBerry tablet. You know, we end up with the Nokia, whatever the heck they've got out right now that they're very unhappy with. You know, because it's, you know, and think about the automobile industry. The automobile industry, Bob Lutz has got this new book out called Car Guys and Bean Counters. And you think about, like, Chev like if I said to you, Picture an Oldsmobile. You go, I don't think, I don't think anybody can do that. <laughs> There's no picture. Like for 50 years, they, they spent amazing R&D on designing this car. I can't, no visual. Buick. Mm, no, not exactly. No, no. You know, so, so, so people want to do this. They spend their R&D budgets, but they don't actually get the outcome. And then this last one is, hey, we're going to do it. And believe me, great ideas and great initiatives come out every year in large companies. But we start to march down the path. And we run into something that sometimes we call the web of favors, which is we're going to do something radically new, except Harry, oh, but I promised Harry that we wouldn't actually, so I can't do, no, Harry can't be part of this. Harry gets to have his own particular thing. Okay, oh, and, oh forgot about Mary and Sherry. Yeah, okay, Gary. And eventually the web of favors just kind of stops us in, in our tracks. So these are not trivial challenges, okay? But if we, don't, if we don't deal with them, what happens is we get this thing, this problem we call a power failure. And, and the reason we call it a power failure is because we're making a big distinction in this book between managing performance, which is what the American global system is extremely good at, and managing power. Power, is this, as the second bullet says, it fuels performance. It's the leading indicator of what you can do in the future. It's the, it's the stuff that venture guys invest. If you think about a venture investment, there's no performance. There's only the, the expectation of power that will lead to performance. So the serious materials person I talked to tonight, you know, not a lot of history yet, but, but we think these serious materials can really change the world, that kind of idea. So you got to invest in power if you're going to go for the long term. But the problem is when you actually get inside the boardrooms, and I'm on the board of a, I've been on the board of Lawson Software before I was on the board of Documentum. I'm currently on the board of Akamai. So these are really good companies. You get on the board of these companies, and it's hard to create the dialogue around power. It's very easy to create the dialogue around performance because the CEO's compensation plan is tied to it. There are, there are you know, we're going to hit certain revenue targets. We're going to hit certain earnings targets. The, the, the dialogue around performance is very, very strong, and it's very authentic. But the dialogue around power is very vague. And, and, and if, they're, if members of the board are from outside the industry, they feel that they're not even qualified to talk about it, which is very, very wrong. But you can certainly say how people would feel about it. Say, hey, I'm not part of the petrochemical industry. I'm not part of your industry. I don't really think I'm qualified. And the answer is, well, 
we've, we've got to figure out a way to, to, to deal with power, right? It's like we recognize power when we see this. This is the, the Supreme Court Justice who said, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. He wasn't actually a member of the House of Representatives. He was actually a Supreme Court Justice. <laughs> But the point about it is we got to do better than that. We can't just say we recognize power when we see. We've got to find a way to talk about it in an intelligence way. But in the absence of that, what we do is we just manage performance more intensely. And so we consume even more power. And so what we're doing without realizing it is we are, we are presiding over the liquidation of our company. Because if you would focus on performance, you consume fuel. And if you don't generate more fuel than you consume, Right? You're going you're to run out of gas. You're going to drain your battery. And that's where those 40 companies got to the point of, hey, no juice left in, in the battery. Right? So it's a trap. So OK. Now, I just wanted to raise your spirits with this talk. I was kind of a, kind of a feel good sort of, you know, I'm kind of an Obama kind of, kind of guy. I just want to feel good. Right. OK. All right. So, so would you do anything about this? That's the next question. Uh, so, and, and I think the answer is yes. And, and actually, I'm going to suggest that the answer is not only yes, I think the answer is tough in the sense that there's an enormous amount of inertial mass. But I don't think it's tough in the sense that so that's what we're going to talk about tonight is not radical. And, it, and it's not like, well, yes, you just all have to believe and jump off a tall building, right? I mean, this, it, it, I, what I want to present to you, I think, is pretty straightforward. But it's, it's challenging simply because of the size and the history. But the idea is. You need to get the management team to focus on power. In, in the annual planning calendar, if you assume that we focus on performance, the day that, we, that the CFO sends around last year's annual plan and tells every senior executive, for planning purposes next year, take your last quarter, multiply it by four, and start from there. Okay? And that starts a resource allocation zero-sum game that is, that is very much about I will get whatever I can because if I don't fight for it now, I'm never going to get it. So if you try to have a dialogue about strategy during that period of the calendar, not going to happen. You're just going to get elbowed off the ice. So Bruins are playing the Canucks. We'll see what happens tonight. OK. <laughs> so what you'd like to do is the quarter before that, when it's still sort of free space, to have this dialogue around power and, I, and, 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 and to be able to allocate resources to power programs before you get into performance budgeting. So what you're going to do is you're going to take some part of the pie, however much you can stomach, and say, we're carving this piece out first. And we'll talk about what, how that works and where it works and where the challenges are. But that's the plan. And the third thing is, it's not really R&D money that matters, which is a mistake we made for most of my adult life. The R&D funding has always been there. It's the go-to-market funding. It's getting the R&D to market that doesn't work. So we'll talk about that more in a bit. And then drive accountability for power into the operational plan. So stop having compensation plans that are only about performance. So you have to therefore figure out, well, what are the metrics that would measure power? Because we haven't had those metrics. And then hold people accountable to them through the comp plan. And the framing idea here, so in the crossing the chasm was sort of the technology adoption life cycle was sort of the framing model for that book. Uh, in this book, it's called The Hierarchy of Powers. And it's a framing model, to, and I'll share it with you in a minute, that's designed to say, OK, so how do you begin the conversation around power without getting up into sort of like, you know, like engineers feel like how marketing is. You know, engineers know they're supposed to market, but they know that they can't market. So they're just hoping that somebody could make something that made sense out of it, because and, and, they hate the sort of fuzzy dialogue. Well, the same thing around power. It's just like, do we have to have a, do we have to like hold hands and like have a power moment? I mean, it just feels really ucky. So, so, so how would you actually do this in a way that, that's credible? And I just want to suggest the book, the book draws on this background. The last uh, decade, we've personally in my firm spent time with the CEOs of these 20 companies doing this stuff. Now, did every company have a complete total success? No. But all of these had, had pretty damn interesting success around applying this stuff. So this is not like some ideas we got in a research lab. But here's the model I want to, the books build around. And I'm going to actually take you down the model in general, and then I'm going to take you into one, just one power tonight to sort of kind of show you what it might look like to double click. But what this model says is, if you're going to talk about power, you need to start at the top and work down this hierarchy. Because the number one predictor of your company's performance is how good are the categories you're in. If, you're in. if you are in the book publishing business, 
I don't care if you're a genius, right? This is a very tough business to be in, right? And if you right now are in computer storage, you can be the number seven company, three par, and get bought for like, I don't know, $3.4 billion. This dude, you're in the right category, right? So the first thing is, what are the growth rates of your major categories, right? And, 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 where, are, and, 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 and where is that? Where are they in the life cycle? And are they in the middle kind of cyclical phase or in the high growth phase? Or more dangerously, are they in the decline phase uh, going forward? The second thing is, OK, in those categories, how powerful are we? This is the, this is the Jack Welch moment where he used to say, GE will be number one or number two in a category, or we won't play. Because what happens if you start being less than number, uh, number two it just gets very unfun to play. You, you, you have no, very little bargaining power. It's, it's, it's not much fun at all. Now, one of the things you can do if you're not number one or number two is say, well, I'm not number one or number two in the world, but I'm number one or number two in my target markets. The other thing you can do is you can say, as I'm, if I'm growing, what are the early bellwether markets that whoever wins this market will be the ones who will be the early, like winning the New Hampshire primaries. You know, this is, this is the new lead candidate. So market power can be really, really uh, uh, effective. And, and it's just tragic that large companies can't use it uh, very well because, because it, it's like saying, well, I couldn't, join, I couldn't enter any of the primaries. And so I didn't get nominated for president. Right? So but yes, you could have entered the primaries. The offer power is then how different are your offers? We have these folks in Cupertino who, I mean, Steve Jobs has just shown that offer power can transform the planet. And he did it three times in a decade, it's, which is just like rubbing our noses in it. You know, if it was once, he got lucky, right? I mean, the Motorola Razor, hugely hit product, right? But no, he had to do it. What? Then he did it again, and then he did it again. It's like, oh. and when the iPad came out, I thought, aha, bridge too far. Tablets, I've seen tablets fail. This is his Armageddon. This is his Waterloo. I have this instinct, you know, for the future, right? <laughs> <laughs> just oh, it's perfect. So, so you know, I mean, it, the offer power is there. This is a company that was six months away from bankruptcy in 1997. Okay, so maybe leadership could make a difference. Execution: the ability to drive changes to the tipping point. So many initiatives in, in, in large corporations get two thirds of the way to the finish line, and and, and, and it just they just can't get the, the last the last one. So, how would you drive things to tipping points? So that's the, the, the idea behind this is you would align things to escape, achieve velocity. And we have, a, we have a diagnostic that we use with our clients, which is just, it just and this is something, if you do, took only one slide back from this presentation, it might be this one just to ask your, your colleagues. So how, how, how are, are we in the high growth hot categories in our, in our sector, or do we have category envy, right? Uh, do, we, do our customers and competitors see us as the team to beat, or is that, would that be somebody else? Are we winning the key primaries, and are we winning them fast enough? Do our core offers set the bar, or are we playing a lot of catch up? Right? Can we make stuff happen to make it stick, or are we continually pushing the reset button? Right? So, so, and, every, and, the, and the thing is, you know, there'll be places where you say, you know what? We're not perfect, but some of those we're pretty good at. And there'll be other ones you go, man, we're letting a lot of air out of the balloon through that particular uh, hole in, in, in our fabric. So where do we have anchor strengths, and where do we, where do, we do better? And if you look at, this is an example of our friends at Apple because God, everybody seems to use them as an example. I, I refused to do it in the book because it was just, you know, it was just so prevalent every place else in the world. But look what they did. Three categories, music, mobility, and media, all in hypergrowth. They're the team to beat in all three. It's not even close today. Now, it will become close. I mean, the Android guys are, I mean, there's stuff going on, right? No current need to target market segments right now. Apparently, the world is their segment. Uh, offer power, not just iPhones, iPads, iPods, but iTunes and App Store. So think about that. And then they did all of the above in one decade. Right? Just revolutionized the music industry, which they now kind of own, the mobile telephony industry, which was, had walled gardens everywhere and was un, un, unbreachable. Well, guess not. And, and, and now this, this tablet thing, which is for the first time, I mean, every enterprise in the world is having to bring these things in because the CEO brought it in and said, support this device. If you're, <laughs> you've been there. <laughs> yeah. OK. And that's why Apple is currently the most highly valued. I just heard this week that uh, Apple's worth more than Microsoft, HP, and Dell combined. 
Now, do I think that's a little overvalued? Yes, I do. Do I think they're undervalued? Probably a little, but still, you know, who would have thunk, right? Okay, so the, the key thing that the, 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 those five points of failure I called out before map to the hierarchy of powers. So depending on what point of failure you want to address, it kind of tells you we need to install in our management dialogue a vocabulary around this type of power and a set of frameworks and models that make this type of power the, the power of the moment. So the, the game here would be, look, pick a point of attack and then engage with the others as necessary because you've got to start somewhere. And, and, and so, and, and, we, and we've worked with clients on all five of these. What I thought I'd do with you tonight is just start at the top. I want to, I want to start with this thing around category power. So I'm kind of, at this point, I'm going to actually, whatever your current day job is, I'm also going to make you a member of the board of directors of a Fortune 500 company. By the way, you should expect kind of director fees on the order of $300,000 to $400,000 a year, if that's OK with you. Some of that does come in stock, which you'll be expected to hold. I hope you can put up with that. And you have to kind of travel, and you know, there's a few things you got to do. And by the way, you have to sign the uh, audit committee report, which you might think about how you look in an orange jumpsuit if there's something wrong with that particular report. But the, the fact of is, you're a member of the board of directors. So this is, I, I really, you are on the board. This is, and your job is to be a steward of the future of this company. That, and you, you're not an expert. The management team runs the company. The board does not run the company. But the board is supposed to advise and consent, if you will, with the management team's ideas about where this should go. And we're going to have a discussion around category power. Because maybe what we'll say is we are Xerox, and our, and our history has been in copiers. But we kind of know that copiers are moving on. Now, what Xerox has done is invested heavily in services. They bought a huge co services company. That's where they're going. And they have both document management services, but also business process outsourcing services. Or we could be on the board of HP. Just brought Mr. Apotecker in. Mr. Apotecker took a look at things and said, you know, I'm a software guy. Don't see a lot of software around here. Maybe we should do a little more software here. So, that, so he's thinking about getting, that's his category power issue. And again, HP's in printers. And not, you know, VJ, who runs the printing business at, uh, at HP, will tell you, you know, his daughter went to college and didn't bring a printer. Because she said, Dad, we don't print anymore, right? And oh, well, what about your photos? No, we don't print photos either, Dad. Sorry. You should ask the people at Kodak about that. So, so, <laughs> so which by the way, was VJ's old boss, Antonio, right, is at Kodak. But, but so the point is, and Kodak, by the way, Antonio, you could be Antonio Paris. So category, re-engineering the thing. So here's the deal. You start with this model that has been around uh, the, the Valley now for 20 years, which is, OK, every category at some point had a beginning with a technology adoption life cycle. And then it goes into this thing of having a growth market where basically the category is just, it's called secular growth. That means that for one time, everybody's buying whatever it is. Everybody is buying an iPod, or everybody is buying a cell phone, or a laser printer, or a PC, or a website, or whatever it is. And, and, and the market just grows. And then at some point, it kind of levels off. It's like, OK, I think we all, did we all get one? Yeah, we all got one. OK, we're buying our second one? Yeah, OK. Well, as you start buying your second, third, and fourth, you're in C. And you can be in C, as it says, indefinitely. The, the automobile industry is in probably its eighth decade of C. Not clear that, that, that the combustion engine will make, the combustion engine might, might move into D in my lifetime. Okay? Hasn't yet, but it might. D is, is like, OK, now we're on the wrong side of the curve. Now, now we're losing altitude. Now, it can still take a long time, but, but we're losing altitude. My publisher, Harper Business Books. Not a lot of future there, right? <laughs> so their big claim to fame is, I can get you into the big box retailers, like Borders. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you got this sense of, ooh, OK, maybe not so strong. OK, OK, so, 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 so the game here is, as you're looking at this thing and you're thinking about categories, you're saying, look, I want to be in high growth. And that's going to be on the B side, right? But I know that a lot of my business is in C. What I'm really thinking is like, I want some cool stuff in B, a lot of stuff in C, because that pays the bills. And if I get into D, I've got to be careful. I've got, I, I got to think about how am I going to get myself out of D. So if you look at this from the point of view of a, of, a, of a matrix, this is a very, very simple matrix, sort of a takeoff on something that Boston Consulting Group did. 
says, look, how many of our businesses are in high growth categories versus low growth? How many are in material versus non-material? So high versus low means high growth is something that would attract a growth investor, probably 15 to 20 to 30 percent, that kind of growth, not 8 to 10. Low growth is probably anything below any single digits low. 10 to 15 is kind of tweener, somewhere in there. But that's, but in other words, this isn't about relative to the other businesses in my company. This is relative to the other businesses that investors could put money into. Material is how big a part of it is of our total revenue. It's material when it's about 5 to 10% of our revenue. If it's, if it's like 1 or 2%, no matter how exciting it is, that, yeah, I know, but 99% of your company is in something else, right? So it's got to be material and high growth. So high growth, future rewards, material, presence rewards. That's where we're trying to get, right? So you look at it and you say, OK, that wasn't, that, that did, that, you don't need a complete MBA. You don't want like two years of MBA to do that. I think we could do that pretty quick. I think I got it. So how are we doing? So you ask the management team to present their stuff. And here's what they say. They say, you know, we've got some really, really strong traditional businesses. They've been our, they've been our mainstay for decades. They're going to be our mainstay for decades before. They don't grow very fast, but man, they're the future. You know, they're rock solid. And we are investing in the future. We're investing in some very, very interesting technologies, really. Yeah, we got a couple of old, you know, kind of things that we're, we don't talk about a lot, but you know, they still throw off a few bucks, so don't, don't throw them away. And the board says, how come we don't have any businesses in quadrant two, right? Quadrant two, remember the plus plus one? You remember the one, that's the one, the MBA school? Plus plus, left, upper left. You know, Oregon, Northwest, right? That's where Peter and I are from. So it's just like, wh why not that? OK. So I'm going to show you why not. And I'm going to use motion graphics. I want you to no know expense has been spared on this <laughs> presentation. But you're, you are the general manager of that business. And you say, I've got to get more growth. OK, R&D. That's what gets growth, right? And it does for a while. But it's OK. We got more money. We'll spend it again, OK? Okay, we, okay, we could do this again. But you notice how each time it gets kind of like less and less time on the left side of that thing. So you say, what's going on? Okay. Well, first of all, understand this is not a bad market. This is a well-established, highly material business. So it's not like you're going, I hate you. But and the, I mean, and the reason it's, it's great is, hey, the customers all know us. They all buy from us. They, they know what our products are. Our sales force understand the products. Our cost of sales is low. What's not to like? And the only thing that's not to like is it's not growing very fast. The R&D investments in that market will help for a while because better is better. But after a while, the category gets older and older. Now it's like, well, Techron, it's good, it's good, it's good, you know, really. But, 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 but you know, good is good. Could I, could I stop at a shell station? If I, would that be OK? You know? And, 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 and if, it, if it is OK, now all of a sudden my bargaining power becomes a lot less. Right? Now revenue, re, you know, pricing deflates, revenue growth stalls. Unit growth continues because people are still buying more and more of this stuff, but revenue growth flattens. So you see that a lot in tech, right? More, we shipped t 10 times as many chips this year as three years ago, but the revenue of the industry was, grew 3%, that kind of problem, right? So cause, and why? Because lots of pe competitors are meeting the good enough standard, and the category becomes commodity growing and value add shrinking. And so we, we realize in Boston consulting terms, we're overfeeding a herd of aging cash cows, right? Because we're spending most of our money here. We're spending most of our sales compensation dollar here. We're spending most of our R&D dollar here. We're spending most of our company's money here. And it's not that we shouldn't be. It's that we probably should put these aging cash cows on a little bit of a diet, right? We just kind of, because we ought to start squeezing that. Just think, OK, great. I'll do that if, if you'll help, if you'll show me that, that you'll spend that money here and that these new things will take over. Hey, great, I'm, I'm for it. So how do these guys do? Again, no expense spared with these graphics. Well, <laughs> they struggle, right? They launch, they look really exciting, they get a lot of fanfare, and it's like, man, what happened? You, do you remember like three, I, I don't know, that was Harry, oh Harry, yeah, oh boy, bad odor now, isn't he? So, so it just doesn't work. You say, well, what's going on now? I mean, come on. This was the future. Well, the problem is, OK, so the, 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 the point of the graphic is these red dots are not getting over that line, meaning these businesses cannot reach material size inside my corporation. Why not? Well, part of the problem is the products are immature. 
We don't have the right relationships. The cost of sales is high, and my salespeople don't know who to call on. And when they do call on those people, they don't really know what they're talking about because it, it's, all, it's all this new world, right? And the growth rates are high, even with that. We, we have very high growth in these companies, but it's off such a tiny base. Oh, you grew 300% from 3 million to 9 million in my $10 billion company. <laughs> kind of a rounding error, right? So even though you're growing really, and by the way, though, how did you grow? Well, we had an overlay sales force of specialists who came out because our regular sales force can't sell this stuff yet. We had dedicated marketing. By the way, we had to bring in professional services because the thing doesn't actually work yet. So we, you know, but we made it work, and then we have a happy customer. And they go, yes, did you use the singular? Y yes, we did actually. A happy customer, <laughs> right? Right. You know, we have 30,000 customers in this company. I just checking, just wanted to make sure you knew. Okay. So, and the problem is, I can grow faster, but in order to grow faster, I got to spend even more money. And remember, at this budget cycle, when the money gets on the table, it's like, you know, all the, you know, when you're a little tiny immaterial thing, feed the little kid, throw him a scrap. You know, say, I got, you know, there's 27 hamburgers, give him a slider, right? It's okay. But now he's an adolescent. He says, no, I eat three hamburgers for dinner. Right? It's like, no, no, that was my hamburger. No, you're not eating my hamburger. So that's part of the challenge. The field organization is asked eventually to step up and say, look, we can't have all this overlay stuff. You've got to sell this stuff directly with the same sales force that sells the, 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 the legacy business. Those guys go, well, I'll do my best. But I'll do my best is a, is, is a code word for you're hosed, right? Uh, because, because, and by the way, they, they, they're not lying. They, they will and they intend to do their best, but their best won't be good enough. And this is why the venture community routinely kicks the fanny of large companies. Not because, because the, the venture company has nothing else it can do. It's all they can do. And the, and the large company has lots of other things to do, many of which look a lot better. And if from your compensation point of view as a salesperson, they look a whole lot better. Right? And so we're underfeeding a herd of hungry heifers, and we never reach material size. And so you think, OK, this, this I think the technical term is this sucks, right? This is not good. This is not good. And so if you look at this, you say, you say, how would we get out of this? The fellows at McKinsey came up with a very, very great, it was a fabulous insight. Because what they said is, when we've been doing planning, part of the reason we don't solve this problem very well is we've been planning with only two horizons, the present and the future. And they said there's actually three horizons. There's the present. There's the near future, and there's the far future. So horizon one is the present, and that's where we're, we're going to make all our, our, our living. Horizon two is the near future, and horizon three is the far future. And what, they, what you realize as soon as you put this model up and you kind of talk to each other about it for a second is, oh, we're really good at horizon three, and we're really good at horizon one. But we suck at horizon two. And the sad fact is because we suck at horizon two, any investment we make in Horizon 3 is wasted because we can't ever get it into Horizon 1. So, so it does, we haven't solved the problem now, but we have framed the problem. It's a Horizon 2 problem. Here's how it plays out on this materiality matrix. Horizon 3 isn't even on the matrix. Horizon 2 is the attempt to become material. Horizon 1 is, hey, I am material. I am the material dude. And then Horizon 0 is I'm losing materiality, but I still make money. And so when you look at that diagram, you think, so what is actually happening in the corporation quarter after quarter, year after year, annual planning strategy session after annual planning strategy session is the following. The performance management says, hey, the one thing we cannot do is miss our numbers. Let's, let's be clear about this, OK? So we are going to make our numbers. And, and, and therefore, and by the way, our numbers are higher this year than last year. And, and, the, and the product line that's our established product line is a little bit less competitive than it was last year, right? Because it's just a little bit older. So that means it's harder to do it next year. Every year, that challenge of making the numbers is harder uh, uh, under this model. So what do Horizon One managers do? Well, they hoard resources. And this is not a, a, a negative behavior. This is actually Darwin selects for this behavior because they want to make sure they meet their commitments. So they find ways to get every resource they can possibly can. And who do they take it away from? Well, they don't take it away from Horizon 3. They take it away from Horizon 2. So that Horizon 2 person said, I get sales coverage. They said, yes, you do. But you know, it's the last week of the quarter, and I've got to close the quarter. 
So I'll call on that customer, but you've got to wait 10 days. Well, in an emerging business, 10 days is a lifetime. Right? You can't, that's why the venture guy, because the venture guy is calling all those business during that 10 days, right? And so it's, it's off the table. So the Horizon One managers, by the way, won't. Now, if they got out of the Horizon Zero businesses, they could have some resources to give to Horizon Two, but Horizon Zero still got a little money left in the drawer, and I need every penny I can get to make my numbers so I don't get out. And Horizon Three, interestingly, skates through unscathed. So all those 40 companies that went out of existence, they all had massive R&D budgets in their last year. Did you remember digital? Palo, it ran most of Palo Alto in the last year of its existence, right? So, so the point about this exercise is Horizon 3 isn't affected because Horizon 3 is not going to market. It doesn't need a sales force. It doesn't need a marketing uh, capability. It doesn't need professional services. It just needs R&D, and we can give them R&D. Now, we may not give them as many engineers as they want, but they get, they get more than a venture startup would ever get. Okay? So it's not an R&D problem. So the Horizon 2 gap. This is, what, this, is the prob, this is the key framing idea. Horizon 2 gap. All other horizons are OK. One gets first dibs. Three gets outboard. Zero sneaks under the covers. H2 is out in the cold. It's competing directly with Horizon 1 for the same resources, the same salespeople, the same marketing people, the same professional services people. And H1 just said, I can't give them to you. I just can't do it. Okay? So as, it's not a failure in R&D. This was the big aha from the last book, which was called Dealing with Darwin. Because Dealing with Darwin, was, we thought it was, I thought it was a failure in innovation. It's not a failure in innovation. It's a failure in go-to-market. Okay? So I'm going to close with, what do you do about this? And, and we think, th and, and these are four areas, and we think these, we don't think they, they think these four actually are the four that matter. Not that you couldn't do other things. We think these are the four that matter. They're very traditional areas. And what we're going to ask people to do is not that weird. But it is definitely not what is being done today. And so I just want to give you one slide on each, and then we'll, uh, I'll close this thing. And then I definitely want you guys to, like if your crap detector has been going off, you know, ding, 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 <laughs> just put up your, let, 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 let's, let, let's get at this pretty quick, OK? All right, I'm glad that you guys didn't put it on ring. I'm glad you set, set your crap detector to silent. OK, so planning and budgeting. So planning and budgeting turns out to be hugely um, uh, De de definitive of whether you can actually solve this problem or not. And remember, what you, 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 if once the CFO circulates last year's annual plan to do next year's budget, it's kind of game over. So the first idea is you organize planning and budgeting by horizon, and you attach all funding requests to one horizon only. What that means is I'm gonna, I have 100% of my resources. How much am I going to spend on horizon one, horizon two, horizon three? You know, you may say, hey, I, this is a bad year. I'm going to spend 95% of my resources here, 2% here, and 3% here. Or you say, it's a good year. I'm going to spend 90, 89% of my resources here, and 4% here, and 7% here. Great. Whatever it is, the point is, don't, don't cheat. So let funding requests compete for the money in their bucket, but don't let them take resources from the other buckets. And that funding is both go-to-market funding as well as R&D funding. So it's, it's, the, it's, the entire, it's the entire thing. Otherwise, the, the Horizon 1 or the Horizon 3, both of which are more glamorous, will steal from Horizon 2. So the executive team sets the overall resource allocation. You set percentages of how much of our, and you hold your general, your EVPs and your general managers accountable. We said we were going to spend X percent in each Horizon. Let Matt show your annual plan to me and present to me that you've actually done that. Direct functions to do that, special attention paid to market-facing functions. I want to make sure you're not sharing a, a H1 market resource with an H2 market resource, because we know what happens when that happens. The H2 one loses out, and then do the interlock. So the key, the key realization here is don't bother to fund Horizon 3 if you're not going to fund Horizon 2. Don't fund Horizon 3 R&D if you're not going to fund Horizon 2 go to market, because it's going to be an expensive journey. Pro it, it may be more expensive than the R&D itself. And, and, but if you don't sign up for it, wh why would you do the R&D? Other than for corporate entertainment, right? Which, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of that. OK, that was one. That was the planning and budgeting idea. Just not, and, and you would do this the quarter before you circulate the last year's budget. So if you did that, if, if the CFO circulates that budget in July, we're having this discussion in April, May, and June. The second thing you do is, if you're going to get a Horizon 2 business to materiality, you have to run it like a venture-backed startup, which is weird. 
Now, business, w w the way you do that in a large corporation is you create a business unit just for that business, which seems bizarre. We're a $20 billion company. We have a $17 million revenue stream, and we're creating a business unit? And the answer is yes. Yes, we are. The functional organization for everything else is much better. That's why the organization in general has EVPs of sales, EVPs of engineering, whatever. But what we've learned in the venture model is between 10 and 100 million, this is the right model. To get from 10 to 100 fast, and we think you, a large company's got to do this in two years. So it'd be really fast. You've got to give them totally dedicated resources, faster, more agile. And this BU structure is virtual and temporary. What that means is this BU will not exist three years from now. Either it will not exist because you have failed, or it will not exist because we have now reintegrated your business back into our functional organization. But for the period when you're this vulnerable adolescent, we're going to give you a, your own world. Not the world of a child, which is Horizon 3 R&D, no responsibilities. Not the world of an adult, which is Horizon 1, make your numbers. It's, you're going to make your numbers in this middle one, but it's a different set of numbers, and it's a different, it's a different thing. You don't ask a 13-year-old, so where's your 401k? Right? But you do ask them, how are you doing in English? You know? How are you doing in math? Right? So there's a report card for, for adolescents. It's not the same one as for kids. It's not the same one as for adults. But you, but you hold them, in that, in, in, and you send them to a place called a high school, which is not a college, but it's also not a, you know, a, a, K through, uh, a K through eight. So the business unit structure is temporary and it's virtual, meaning you don't actually, you can actually second people out of the line functions, create this business unit, run it for the, for the duration, and then send them back. Now some won't want to go back. Some will say, no, I really, really like doing this. I want to do it again with some other product. But a bunch will go back and they'll say, and by the way, I know how to sell this thing. It's now a $100 million business going to $300 million. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just kill with this new knowledge. I'm really excited about being part of the mainstream sales force and being the new kid on the block that knows how to sell the cool new stuff. Because it's now big enough to matter. And I can get the, the resources and the attention I need. So that's the second idea. Two more and we're done. The third idea is different metrics for different phases of life. This is a bit like childhood, adolescent, adulthood. If you look at the one on the left, that every, every executive who's ever run a corporation knows the one on the left. It's how you, run, how you operate a business. Revenue versus plan, bookings, contribution margin, market share, wallet share. It's the standard stuff. If you go to the far right, Anybody who's ever been in a startup or trying to get even a startup initiative inside a large corporation, go get a great flagship customer. Get Walmart, get American Express, get somebody and with a big deal. And, and, you know, and they'll, Walmart will put RFID everywhere, you know, kind of thing. Name brand partners. And, and, and the, the engineering was done by IBM. You know? and, and people talk about it. And this is going to be you know, data, you know, data mining is going to be the next big thing. Or you know, social networking, whatever the heck it is. right? So that's fine. It's not a real business, but it's a real story. And it puts it on the map. But the one in the middle is, how fast can you get from a handful of customers and maybe $10 million business to enough customers to have a $100 million going concern that you, that you can kind of see how I can now begin to leverage the size of the corporation to take that $100 million? Because that's what John Chambers said. John, John and I were talking about this in the middle 90s. And he said, look, Jeffrey. A business under $10 million, you can do anywhere in Cisco, and you can hide it. He said, you, you just hide it. He said, no problem. He said, if it's $100 million, I have a sales force that can take it to a $1 billion. But between $10 million and $100 million, we kill everything we touch. Okay. So that, that was the deal. And, and, and so the issue was, what, how do you get fast from 10 to 100 million? It turns out, this is what the venture community is actually really good at. This is kind of like crossing the chasm in the bowling alley stuff. It's, you, you grow very fast by having target accounts in, 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 in high growth segments, go after the top accounts, sell them very, very much faster than you would sell but, uh, because you're focusing on them, get over a certain deal threshold, get to a certain segment share, and then what happens is the entire segment caves, and they all go to you. This documentum story that was in the original Crossing the Chasm. I mean, they got the, by the time they got the sixth pharmaceutical, the next 20 were in line. 35 of the top 40 pharmaceuticals were documentum customers within 18 months because they just nailed a really tough problem. That's, you see, but that doesn't show up in spreadsheets because you know we only were a $25 million company when that had happened. We, went, we took it from 25 to 45, I guess probably $45 million. We went public as a $45 million company. 
but we had such credibility because you just looked at the customer list and every customer was buying more and more and more and more of the same stuff because it, because it was working. And so that breakthrough, highly focused growth strategy is the key to the red stuff. But that stuff which has to have a narrative behind it because if you put that into the spreadsheet, if Mark Hurd is managing this situation, this will never show because Mark manages entirely through the operational lens of a spreadsheet. And this doesn't ever show in a spreadsheet. It's strategic revenue, not just quantity. It's not just quantity, it's where it's happening. So really, really important. And as, as a board member, that's the key, the key lesson to learn there. Most companies overlook that horizon. Right. The final one, comp. The only deal here is, OK, guys, if we're serious, we're all on the hook. One of the problems in large corporations is, oh yeah, Harry has the growth initiative. Uh-uh. Uh, if Harry has the growth initiative, Harry's twisting slowly, slowly in the wind, as uh, one of the Nixon White House aides called it once. So the CEO or the EVP are, are, should have significant variable comp. Now, by the way, the CEO is on the hook always. The CEO is the ultimate stucky. But, but, but a lot of people who report to the CEO can kind of like, you know, well, actually, uh, that was Larry. <laughs> Not so, but the idea is, no, no, we're all going to be in this boat together. The BUGM should have all of their variable comp on it. The participants, you don't give them phantom stock. This isn't a venture-backed company, but you give them a lot of variable comp saying, if you can get this business unit from 10 to 100 in eight quarters, you personally are going to make your spouse a very, very happy spouse. You're going to bring them a very, very large bonus. You can do that, and we should do that, because the, this is how you get into growth categories and get them to become material. So Horizon 2 would, initiatives are must win, no win, no comp. Uh, uh, so be careful how many you undertake. One of the problems Cisco has had is it undertook way too many of these. Right? And they're, right, they're doing right now, they're trying to re refocus themselves. Not that they weren't good ideas, but there were too many of them. Okay, so, so these are the five, I guess what I would just take you away, and I, I know you've been drinking from a fire hose a little bit, but this is kind of what we try to install in one, in every hierarchy has two or three or four of these models where you say, look, if you're gonna nail category power, in our view, this is what you got to do. You got to use the life cycle to figure out where is our, what is our, where are we now, and actually plot the growth materiality matrix so that you know, okay, where our business in the quadrants. Use the three horizons, call out the horizon two gap problem, and then use those four best practices to say, are we really doing this? Are we really doing this? Are we creating the account, the accountability for power? So that's what I wanted to, to share with you. Just a key takeaway. Uh, I think the challenges have, have changed. Certainly. The, the, the growth challenge in a large company is very different than the growth challenge in a, in a startup, which is what we started with, with crossing the chasm inside the tornado. Uh, our old habits persist, and as we get older, they become more persistent. I can testify to that. Uh, new perspective is required, and models and framework help, but at the end of the day, courage is still required. And, and this, is a, this is, I have enormous respect for the management of, of large corporations because they are the fabric of our society. And if, if we're going to make the society sort of take the next step, we need the help of these corporations. So that's what it's about. Thank you very much. I thank you for sort of putting up with that. Thanks. <laughs> yep. Yep. So I would love to start getting either comments or questions or pushback of any kind. So I think somebody's got to put up a hand because here we go. So venture capitalists are really good at um, taking care of the scalability things to push category, category two into category one. But in large companies, um, some things can hover in category two for an awful long time, you know, and they continue to have, you know, quote unquote, you know, flagship customers and all that stuff. How, do, how does a company deal with that? Right. This is, it's a really important question because they do, they kind of go into this, nothing, one of the things you hear people say in large companies is we never can kill anything around here. So we have essentially zombie initiatives, right? Who sort of walk the halls that, you know, and, and the eight years in the chasm, it's like, well, oh, you can just die. Uh, uh, so so I, the, the rule is three years and you're out. So it's a three year race. It's a three year race. It says you're, you're going to grow an order of magnitude in three years. We actually try to do it in two, but we know you can't make it in two. But you can grow much faster than a venture company because you've got, if you have Cisco on your card or, or, or any major corporation on your card, you can get the meeting. If you say apotaxis on your card, it's a little challenging. Uh, could you spell that for us, please? So, so, so you know, you, there's reasons why you ought to actually be able to grow faster if you could get the resources. So the game is it's a three-year play. 
And, and then at, at three years, no, you're out. Because, you know, evolution requires natural selection. Natural selection requires death. There's no selection without death. So you, you got to be able to, but it's a great, it's a great question. Yeah, there's one back here, and there's one back over here, too. But please, it'll be pushed back. This is good stuff. Thank you. Hi. Uh, venture capital companies have a 2 to 3% success rate. So my understanding is that for every 100 companies they uh, invest in, only two or three succeed. Is it realistic for large companies to um, put in that amount of effort? So for every 100 initiatives in the H2 category, um, expect a 98% failure rate? Yeah. I think so. That's it's a terrific question. And I, the, math is, that, the math is not quite right. I mean, uh, if you look at it, because I'm in a venture firm, uh, so if I uh, look at a successful portfolio, probably only two to three percent are like the mega win, the, the 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 Facebook, the eBay, the whatever winners. But but you probably expect to return three to four or five times the fund, that kind of magnitude, and you probably do that on less than half, for sure, less than half of the stuff. So the question then is, can a public company play venture capital? Because there's a portfolio in venture capital, you can, and the investors signed up for that. Whereas the public investor is saying, no, I want to see your annual quarterly growth. So two things. One is, it's almost the bigger you get, almost certainly it's a much better bet to buy the material business into your company. So instead of trying to incubate a material business and get it over horizon two inside the company, let the venture community or whatever get, get it together. Now, there's two versions of this game. What Oracle is doing is taking very large companies and consolidating them. That's something you, that doesn't give you growth exactly. It, it kind of it, it gives you sort of a, a very strong position in a mature market, a stronger position. But but if you're acquiring like when Cisco acquired Calpana and Granite and Grand Junction and Granite and those things in the 90s, they were acquiring switch companies that were growing like a weed, and their stock price the day after they announced the acquisition would go higher than the price they paid for the company, right? So that's investors saying do this again and again and again. So I, I and then the question is well okay if that's the case. Shouldn't we shut down our labs and just, you know, not do any futuristic R&D? The problem with that is if you want talent in your company, you've got to give them a little frosting on the cake. I mean, it's, I'm, it's like, come on, people. I can't just, don't just tell me I'm supposed to come here and maintain for the, my whole life. So, so the question then is, well, how much should we do and where should we do it? Uh, sustaining engineering is great, but we want to do some of this. And so most companies say, I am willing to uh, devote X to high risk, things because I think my domain knowledge gives me an advantage that even the venture guys don't have. Because I, I'm in this industry, I really understand these issues maybe better than they would. But having said that, they, we then tend to, we tend to create this thing where those, those initiatives, they get, they get actually quite good starts. The R&D that comes out of large corporations is probably better just on average than the R&D that comes out of venture-backed startups. But it just never gets to market. It just can't. And so that, that issue of making sure you carve out that corridor for whatever much you risk. And I think, I think you could take the, I still think it's probably, if you, if you got one out of every two across the finish line, which is the standard that, that John set for Martin De Beer at, at Cisco, that would be great. That would be great. Come on, people. This can't be that. Is there, 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 there we go. OK, here we go. There we go. Trained at I2. <laughs> yeah. So you need some supply here, right? So, uh, Jeff, great talk. Uh, question on the category. So would you say Apple created the power in this category rather than finding themselves into a good category? Yeah. So, you know, if you are, uh, so, and to contrary to that, would you say some of the big networking companies around here could not create that same power of the category, which in turn drove down their revenues? So. Right. so it's interesting. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's a little weird to, to say, well, Apple's really successful because it's in three great categories. Well, yeah, but only because they entered them, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like, it wasn't like mobile phones was a great place to be before Apple was there, right? Or, 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 the, or the music, uh, our, uh, you know, um, MP3 players was a great place to be. Um, but, but, the, but in most situations, if you, look at, if you look at the world, you start saying, look, there are mega trends that will drive category growth into secular growth. The healthcare issue in the United States, the cyber terrorism issue that, that is worldwide. Um, you know, the, the, the whole moving toward tr taking consumer, uh, all the consumer uh, internet experiences and saying, how do we adapt them to the enterprise? I mean, th these are things that are going to drive hundreds of billions of dollars. And so, in those situations, and, and, and people know that. And, and, and they're thinking, well, so how do I get, 
And this, so there's no, it's not like there's lack of opportunity. It's not like the boards are going, oh my god, what will we do? They know what they want to do. It's this issue of how do I get my, how do I get my foot out of the, out of the old stuff? And, and, and the part of the deal is you can actually get people to release resources here if you give them some place to go. But in the absence of being sure where you want to go, what they say is, well, let's just cost reduce here and we'll build up a little stockpile and eventually we'll figure out where to go. And then people are going, no, 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 no. I, that's too much sacrifice for too little pla place to go. So I, I, I think, I think the, the issue of, you know, you look, at, you look at the energy world, you look at, you look at the biotech world. I mean, there, there's so much work to be done on this planet. And, and there's so much money that wants to go behind that work if you could just put your company in its way. And, and so, uh, but in the short term, there'll be some performance hits, and that's 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 where the challenge the challenge happens. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, uh, so I've actually read multiple of your books, as as well as Clayton Christensen's. I'm I'm curious. Have you ever thought about sort of developing the next level of model below it in terms of an operating framework or next? I mean, clearly, if you read almost every book in this in the space. There's a big hole. There, there was Hoshin in the 70s, you know, that, that Hewlett Packard started. There was sort of 10 step. There's ACT, ISM. There's a bunch of different sort of models, but nobody seems to have figured out if you're sort of at a, at a division or a business unit level how to execute on either an H1, an H2, or an H3 horizon. And I think it's a critical hole in, in all of the books that go on in this space. So, so the answer at that level is guilty as charged uh, completely. Uh, I think in this book, where we would try to address that is to say, you're at the wrong level of power if you're a division manager trying to solve the category power level. Let's go down to either market power or offer power. And it turns out that going after particular niche markets is virtually impossible to do from the C-suite, but can be done from a general manager suite. And when you go down to the offer level, actually a product line manager has more power over offers than the CEO of Procter & Gamble. So, so the, part of the hierarchy of powers was to try to build playbooks at a level where they could actually get traction, as opposed to sitting here you know, as a product line manager thinking of those bozos in the C, you know, in the, in the C suites because they're not doing the category strategy right, rather to say, okay, well, let's do, do what we can. I think, I think there has to be an alignment across them, but, but you're right. And we, we call it going from project to playbook. I mean, the, the, there are a lot of one offs of anything, right? But, but can you get a playbook together? And I think we've not been as good as we should be. So. I think, you know, largely pretty much throw myself on the mercy of the court, but with a little bit of a, a little bit of a trying to get out with the, with the other, uh, other power. Yeah, right here. Hi. Uh, you've talked about Apple and their success, and you're on the board of Akamai, and they had a very symbiotic relationship. When iTunes was ready to be adopted, Akamai had the delivery method to get it out to the customers. Yep. Yep. So what role for those companies who have products in the H2 section is the alliances and the kind of strategic partnership play? You know, it, it's a tough situation. The H2 company is, you know, it's, it, you're an awkward adolescent. It's like, you know, if you're a little kid, your grandparents look at you and go, he could be Mozart. He could be Michael Jordan. He could be both, you know? <laughs> I'm, and that's sort of Horizon 3, right? You know? And then Horizon 1 is whatever you are. Well, let me see your 401k and how's your, you know, whatever. <laughs> Horizon 2 is this sort of pimply-faced adolescent who sulks a great deal, eats and, like, <laughs> never leaves his room, right? <laughs> and now spends his entire time texting. Right? So, 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 so it's, it's hard to attract partners as a Horizon 2 business because you're not really a very good bet for a partner. Because the partner, once you're Horizon 1, you're a good bet. And so what, what you try to do with Horizon 2 is you realize, a, I better be f as self-reliant as I possibly can be, but B, I still have to seduce some support because you can't ever get any place by yourself. But usually it's better to go to a second-tier partner who, want, who sees in you the possibility of getting to the first tier if you and they are successful together. And, so, and, you, and you tend to make an asymmetrical bet in that you say to this partner, you can't say I'll give you an exclusive, but you kind of virtually try to make it as exclusive as you can so that you can have some bargaining power with them and they have some stake and use some skin in your game, et cetera, et cetera. And you try to get through the, this Horizon 2 thing, it's a very dangerous place to be. It's not a place to hang out. That's why we do three years or you're out because it just, you don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't get better the longer you stay. And, and so, but it's tough. It, it's, it's very hard. And, and the, the, the one resource that's virtually impossible to partner with is a Horizon 1 business in your own corporation. That's almost always fatal. So you've got to go outside the corporation to find partners, which drives you crazy 
But then once you get big enough, and by the way, as soon as you get big enough, they say, what are you partnering with? You should have come to us. You say, oh, yes, you're right. I should have. I forgot. OK. And, and at that point, you do capitulate because you're big enough to play with the big kids. But during that period, it, you're like a hermit crab going between shells. You just want to run as fast as you can. <laughs> hey, Jeffrey, uh, great talk. Um, I'm wondering that uh, if, uh, if we, a company wanted to nurturing H2 behavior and thinking, uh, the company cultural structure might have something to do with it. Uh, I'm wondering if you can elaborate your thoughts on how culture and structure might be inf impacted. I, I think it's a great one because, again, if you think about Horizon 1, you think very much of performance cultures. You know, we, we manage by the numbers and we command and control, maybe competition. You think of Horizon 3, it's more about, you know, of oh gosh, you know, we're more of a creativity culture and invention culture. So what, what's the culture for Horizon 2? I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting, and it's a little bit, again, with adolescence, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, where do you, where, where do you give the, 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 you know, the unconditional love and the conditional love? But, but the deal, I think, is I want to create a performance culture to the right metrics. So what I would love to create is a culture saying, the, the ultimate act of heroism in our company is to take a business from $10 million to $100 million. And we are going to celebrate the hell out of it. By the way, what we did at Akamai, by the way, to do this, we, the leaders of the Horizon 2 business initiatives reported out at every board meeting. So they got amazing visibility. Okay? And, 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 the, and the CEO sponsored the Horizon 2 initiatives. Now, he couldn't sponsor very many because, he, because otherwise it becomes a, a head fake. But, and, and, the, and the company, because what, the, but, so in Akamai, the situation was, is the point was made. Akamai delivers bits over the internet. And they were very, very good at it. And they're much better than a lot of people for a long time. But we could see that bits over the internet eventually is a commodity business. So we said, we've got to get into value-added businesses. And there were two that were very, very interesting. One was make consumer websites run faster so that you don't lose your consumer because it takes too long for them to have your page load or, or whatever happens. And the other is you want to run SaaS software over the internet, but you hit the enter button and because of some internet thing, it takes six seconds for before you get your screen back and you go crazy. So both of those were enterprise businesses. They were not content businesses. They were not about the media business. And, and, and they both had you know, very little revenue to start with. But we, 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 we created those two initiatives and we reported out them every quarter. And I think it was the fourth quarter of last year, the sum total of the revenue of those two businesses exceeded all of our content management revenue. Okay, now, that was a four and a half year journey. And, 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 it, had, and it, 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 had, it had to go through Horizon 2. But we'd installed the vocabulary because the vocabulary was around. And they used the vocabulary to hold themselves accountable to it. So that was, that was how it worked. The gentleman over here, yes. So you commented on Cisco and uh, how their 50 market adjacencies, which were H3 initiatives, uh, need to be focused in order to become successful H2 initiatives. Uh, what do you think about a company like Google, which has very different organizational structure, very different culture, and tons and tons of H3? Uh, what are their probabilities for success in the H2 space? Yeah. It's really interesting. Of course, Google's defied virtually every one of my other predictions, so why would it provide, defy this one? <laughs> In case you want to compare my net worth to Larry or Sergey's, either one, frankly, it's just, it's not really that impressive. Um, I think two things, by the way. I think I think the fact that Larry Page just replaced Eric Schmidt is actually Google, in some sense, saying we want to free our company's future from the pull of the past, because that search engine is creating a massive, massive pull. Uh, now, but you look at Android and you think, wow, that that looks like a real the real deal. Chrome, not not so good yet, but you know, we'll, we'll see. And then the gazillion things that they do. My model would predict gazillion does not work. That this whole thing about take all your free time and the world will, you know. But, 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 but Larry and Sergey would go, well, define work. Because we have a 767, and what are you driving around? So, 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 so right? So, so it's fair. But, but, but I, I think at some point, you know, uh, that's still what the model says. So, so either Google is the exception or the model is just wrong. Uh, OK, I think, I think that's worth that. OK, I know you guys have been very patient. It's a little bit warm in here. I'll stick around for a few minutes if you want to ask a few more questions. But thank you very much. Enjoyed having a chance to talk to you.